Hi everybody and welcome to another in our series of structured essay questions. We're looking at exam technique here in particular, how to structure a really good answer to the 25 mark questions. We're going to take another macro topic today and we're going to focus on growth in developing countries. Here's our question. For developing countries in particular, economic growth must always be the most important macro policy objective. With reference to examples, to what extent do you agree with this statement? Again, if you've been following our video series, think about the hooks in the question. So it must always be um, developing countries in particular. Well, we could talk about developed countries. My focus probably will be in emerging markets. The most important macro policy objective. A range of objectives possible. We're going to bring some alternatives in clearly. And with reference to examples, to what extent you agree. So we're looking to pepper our answer with some contextualised analysis. I would start my answer to this question with a clear definition of growth, best defined as the sustained increase in a country's long-term, long-run productive potential or capacity. And then I just a brief development to the point. Growth comes from an expansion of both quantity and quality of factor inputs reflected in higher productivity and the growth-enhancing effects of innovation. One could add in though a, a very brief, succinct definition of what a developing country is if you if you feel you want to do that. That's fine. At some point along the essay, we'll probably want to look and put, a, put an analysis diagram in. It's clearly a growth question. Uh, ADAS analysis will be fine. So too, actually, will be a PPF diagram, for example, here. And that will shift to the PPF as a result of a, an increase in net investment, effective supply side policies. But look, look to include analysis diagrams in your answer where you can. I'm not going to spend too long on the analysis diagrams this time around. I want to build instead a structure to the answer. And we use uh, something called peak and pie. Those people have been coming from with this. Peak and pie is where we, uh, this time we're going to do four points for this essay. We're going to build four main points, uh, three of which will say that economic growth is particularly important, and one of which will say, no, we have to look at other indicators. We make our point briefly. We build contextualised analysis around the point using chains of reasoning. And then we look to make an evaluation point before we move on to the next set of the peak and pie. We try and include the point in the evaluation. So let's have a look at this uh, this answer and see where we go. Here we go, my first point, for developing countries, again going back to the question, sustained growth is crucial for reducing extreme poverty and improving basic living standards. That's my point. My basic point is in red there. It's the point I want to make. But then I want to build the contextualised analysis. So you make your point briefly, and then probably in the same paragraph, build your contextualised analysis. Contextualised just means you're going to use an example along the way. Okay, period of rapid growth increases. Uh, so period of rapid real GDP increases faster than population growth will cause a rise in per capita incomes. This can help lift people out of poverty, as measured by the one pound, one dollar ninety a day, PPP benchmark. Absolute poverty is cut. Households can afford to consume more helping to lower the debilitating effects of malnutrition. Improvements in basic health care, in turn, a little chain of reasoning phrase, can bring about gains in healthy life expectancy, which is both an HDI indicator as well as a factor affecting productivity. And then my contextualised example, a good example is Ethiopia, which has been one of the fastest growing countries in the world with growth of over 10% over the last 10 years. Their per capita income has gone up from about $600 per year to nearly, to nearly 5000 Crucially, uh, I've done some videos on Ethiopia, on Vietnam, on India, on China, on lots of countries. If you want some really strong contextualised data, check out those videos on YouTube. Once we've built the analysis, then we can evaluate. However, start that, you know, that nice, nice way of starting evaluation. Economic growth in developing countries is not always inclusive. Indeed, whilst absolute poverty might be falling, relative poverty can rise as measured by an increase in the Gini coefficient. Countries such as South Africa and Botswana have are two good examples of countries with very high levels of inequality. Now, see what we're doing here? We're making a point, building a point, evaluating a point. Okay? And you could bring in, uh, there's nothing wrong with flow diagrams, for example, a virtual circle of growth idea that if national output goes up, and that, that can trigger higher investment spending. Investment can trigger higher productivity. Higher productivity means people get paid more wages in real terms. People are better off, they can spend more on goods and services. There's nothing wrong by the example by putting a flow diagram if you want the if you want to break up the text. Our second point about the importance of growth for developing countries is as follows. Another 
potential benefit. So this is a way of bridging your writing in the exam. Another potential benefit of growth for lower and middle income countries, you're going back to the question, is that it will attract greater inflows of foreign direct investment. So I'm saying that if growth happens, it makes a country more attractive to FDI. And then you build the contextualized examples for the analysis, sorry. There are many potential benefits from inward FDI. These include the supply side gains from investment in core infrastructure, transport, power, energy, etc., education, healthcare. FDI can also generate more jobs in a formal economy. That's quite important if you because of course if you understand uh, developing countries oftentimes they have a very large informal sector, which in turn will bring the government more tax revenue. Inflows of capital helps to improve a developing country's capital stock, which can then improve productivity and help a nation to achieve catch-up growth uh, with richer countries, as shown by the solo growth model. Now, it depends if you code the solo model in your economics. If you have, you could whack in a solo diagram at that point. If not, that's fine. You've got plenty of other points to make. However, my main evaluation here is to cast doubt on the gains of FDI. So we call this question how many new jobs actually go to domestic workers from, for example, Chinese investment in Africa. Uh, they point to the outflow of profits and well, non-payment non of corporation tax by some multinational corporations. And FDI might also contribute to environmental uh, damage, for example, through rapid deforestation. So this is really the point of saying that growth is important, the key objective is it stimulates investment, investment if you like, accentuates the growth, supports the growth, but there are some downsides as well. And we go again, make a third point. So each time you leave two lines, leave two lines between each paragraph because that allows the examiner to focus on what you're saying. There's a lot of white space on the screen at the moment. You need to leave white space on your exam script as well. My third key reason, and again, think about signposting in the exam, everybody. A third key reason why growth is important. That tells the examiner this is my third point and it's why growth is important. It's going back to the question. Is it will increase tax revenues available to the government to help control their fiscal deficits and debt? Tax revenues depend on many factors, including the basic incomes flowing to households and to households and the profits made by businesses. If economic growth is sustained, an increase in tax revenues might help fund increased government spending on basic public services, including better access to essential education and healthcare. Both of these are important human development indicators and can improve a country's supply side capacity and capability. And greater fiscal stability might also give developing countries scope to weather those sort of inevitable external shocks that come their way, particularly if they're an exporter of primary commodities and potentially improve their credit rating, making them less dependent on aid. So hopefully you can see what I'm doing here. I'm trying to build a chain of reasoning saying why higher tax revenues from growth, if you like the fiscal dividend of growth, could be important for developing countries. But then we have to evaluate. So we're looking here for critical evaluation. We're saying, well, okay, is it going to happen? There's no guarantee that rapid economic growth will lead to much higher tax revenues. And then, you know, there's many, many developing countries, there's a lot of corruption quite a significant non-payment of tax. Tax collecting authorities perhaps not quite as efficient as they might be in advanced OECD countries. And there's my little bit of evidence base there that countries such as Ethiopia and Zambia, tax collection is less than 15% of national income. That's probably insufficient to fund nationwide public and merit goods. The key to this is that for each of these points, essentially it's two paragraphs. A point and analysis is one paragraph. Point included evaluation is your second paragraph. And then the fourth point I'm going to make is to go the other direction. Developing countries need to focus on other objectives than economic growth. Two important ones are controlling inflation and maintaining balance. I'm going to actually put these two points into one chunky paragraph. But of course you might decide, so actually I'm going to make two key points. I'm going to talk about why low inflation might be a key objective on why maintaining an external balance on the balance of payments could be important. But here's my here's my answer. Many fast growing developing countries experience both increases inflation, both from so experience increased inflation from demand pull and cost push factors. High and volatile inflation damages growth 
by hitting people's real incomes, especially poor families, and uh, curbing investment. It's also important to avoid rapid growth leading to an unsustainable increase in the nation's current account deficit. One reason is developing countries often have limited currency reserves and they could easily run into a currency crisis leading to a big depreciation of the exchange rate, which makes essentially imports expensive. As I'm basically saying here that inflation and the balance of payments would, are also needed to be looked at. However, fast growth does not necessarily always lead to higher inflation, particularly for fast growing countries raising its productivity. If you understand about unit labour costs, that's a key point. And the current account is also likely to go into a bigger deficit if a nation is actually importing things like capital technology, equipment, etc., which actually in the future will help a country's aggregate supply. So you have to be slightly wary about just trying to control the current account deficit. It could be the case that you're importing essential technology that's vital to sustaining growth. Anyway, we've made four points. We've, made, we've built four points in the answer. We've tried to contextualise it through analysis. Uh, we'd whack in a diagram at some point, and we have evaluated four points already, which leads us to the final evaluation. We're looking for a reasoned comment or two. Now, some boards ask you for lots of a lengthy final comment. I'm looking to build a chunky paragraph where I try and bring something a little bit more fresh in don't want to repeat all the points I've made. Here's my go at this. There's, there's more than one way to answer the final paragraph, but hopefully this will be useful for you. On balance, I think there's quite a nice phrase to use to start your final paragraph. On balance, the extent to which growth will be the dominant macro policy objective. I'm going back to the question, signpost for the examiner, for emerging countries, depends on where they are at their own stage of development. So notice there in the first three lines I put an on balance in, I've gone back to the question, I'm saying actually it depends on where they are developed. For nations such as Ethiopia, Vietnam and India, all of which I've got some special revision webinars if you want to check out our YouTube channel. Economic growth is crucial as part of their strategy to become mildly prosperous middle income nations in the years ahead and crucially to meet the expectations of their fast growing middle class of consumers. So from a social, political perspective it's important as well. Equally we've seen in China a decision in the latest five-year plan to move away from the fixation on the rate of growth to achieving a better quality of growth, which is more sustainable, balanced and inclusive, focusing in particular on trying to improve the living standards of the bottom 40%. Growth does not guarantee development, but development is hard to achieve without an expansion of GDP, in other words, growth. Therefore, I would argue that, so you're finishing the essay, by coming to a definitive, fairly firm conclusion that for most developing countries, growth will remain the leading objective. Not certainly the most important, but the leading objective of monetary, fiscal and supply side policies. So that's how I would shape my final sort of chunky paragraph. I'm bringing four countries into the equation, into the discussion, and crucially I'm bringing in uh, three perspectives on growth. Just going to quickly revise this with you. So balanced growth is quite important. It's the sort of balance between industries, between different parts of the country, between industrial and construction and farming, between urban and rural, between consumption and investment. Trying to get balanced growth. Sustainable growth is for those of you who are really keen on environmental issues, meeting the needs of current generations without sacrificing resources for future generations financial stability, sustainability, environmental sustainability, and inclusive really focuses on the trying to spread the benefits of growth more widely, uh, lifting people's incomes in the middle of the income distribution, not just at the top, progress in reducing poverty at the bottom 40%, etc. So you could adopt the, the approach that uh, this question is about economic growth, but what type of growth? Inclusive, sustainable, um, balanced, short-term, long-term, etc. Well, I hope you found this useful. I've just taken you through my sort of approach to this particular question, building four key peak and pie points, analysing them, evaluating them, and then coming to a final reasoned conclusion. We're building a series of essay plans on our YouTube channel, and I think these go really well, for example, with our big country profile videos on countries such as China and Vietnam and India and Ethiopia, Greece, 
Zambia, many others besides, that I think would give you fantastic contextual awareness for your A-level exams. Good luck with the revision. Uh, keep checking back to see the new videos as we produce them. Thanks a lot. Take care. See you soon.